we have 25 people watching hello to everyone and welcome back hope everyone had a nice christmas and happy new year and all that jazz episode 53 and the topic of discussion is the ever topical controversial and emotive uh, subject of running shoes now every runner has seems to have an opinion on this and certainly we we know in clinic that the better the runner the more they think their opinion is valid so just because someone runs a 2.33 marathon doesn't mean we have to take what they say about running shoes as gospel, apart from in this case, because our guest, uh, Dr. Chris Napier, is the holder of a, is 2.33 your PB, or am I selling you short there? Have you run a faster one since I... 2.33, yeah. Which is, ridi- which is ridiculous. I'm insanely uh, envious. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but we do trust his opinion, not just because he's a, a runner with incredible pedigree, but he's a physiotherapist, uh, PhD, uh, professor at uh, UBC, yeah, University of British Columbia, um, and of course, co-author with with Dr. Rich Willey of um, what what in the UK at least was was one of the most read, I think, editorials in the BJSM certainly at the last half of last year. So, welcome, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us. We we can't wait to talk running shoes, and we thought we might as well. Uh, actually, I was going to say to you, you've published um, an awful lot of papers on running biomechanics and wearables and in the UK, people that weren't aware of you, that if you if I hear your name now, they say Chris Napier. Oh, he's the guy that wrote the editorial in in the BJSM. I mean, <laughs> are, are you best known for essentially what is a, a an eight hundred word editorial? Because I wrote an editorial in the BJSM. I'm going to be honest, and I don't think other than myself and my co-author and maybe Craig, anyone else read it. So, <laughs> I mean, it, does it bother you that this is what you're most well known for when you're actually a you know a pretty solid researcher otherwise? No, you know, it's funny though, um, because I, I, I'm still fairly new to academia. I've, uh, I've been practicing as a physiotherapist for uh, a little over 15 years now and um, started my PhD. Um, I won't say exactly when because it's a bit embarrassing how long it took me, but um, I finished my PhD in June of uh, last year. And so, um, you know, I've had uh, the, the papers from my, my research rolling out uh, over the last sort of six months or so. Um, but yeah, nothing really stuck quite as much as, as this editorial for sure. And, and uh, it's funny because I'm, I don't actually consider myself a shoe guy most of the time. Um, I, I uh, you know, I prefer sort of uh, doing research on other things, you know, training load and biomechanics and that sort of thing as related to running. But, um, you know, as you've noted, everyone does have an opinion on, on shoes. And, uh, and Rich and I, uh, my co-author Rich Willie and I had been talking about um, sort of writing this for a while, basically because we um, we'd sort of seen a lot of stuff on social media, and, and uh, we'd certainly experienced it um, as practicing physiotherapists and uh, as sort of researchers in the field. Um, that we kind of felt like we had to put something out there to, um, in essence, sort of put things right. Yeah, and, and whether you like it or not, you are kind of the shoe guy now i mean you just put your name into google you put your name into google and the first hit you get is the podcast the, the podcast you did on it i think uh, i can't remember who it was for the, the link to the paper in the bjsm it, there's several newspapers that then picked up the story and ran with it so i mean this is you now that you you know this, right. is, this is the way your career is, is is there future research in the in the field of shoes and footwear on your agenda now now that you're the shoe guy uh i well you know i'm i'm really interested in wearable technology uh and that's sort of where i'm going right now with um with my research and so you know you wear shoes so i guess technically um (laughs) if a shoe company wants to approach me and and say uh hey we want to do something with you working on uh you know some some wearables that are actually uh built into the shoe uh I, i think that's certainly an interesting idea um but uh you know, I've never been actually that interested in the actual um, mechanics of a shoe or, you know, what goes into, um, you know, the, the research and design of a shoe. Uh, it's never interested me that much. So um, <laughs> I, <laughs> that's about that's about the extent of it, I guess. It's kind of interesting, a trend I've noticed where the when you talk to the 230, 235 marathon running guys and girls, they, they're kind of the same. They care far less about shoes than the people running four, four and a half hours. That's just a pattern I've definitely noticed uh, clinically. I, 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 it's just, a, just an observation. For anyone listening um, that, that perhaps didn't have access to the BJSM, didn't read the, 
the editorial. Can we use that as a springboard for the rest of the discussion? And could, do you mind just giving everyone a bit of a summary about what it covered and what, what its sort of take home messages were? Yeah, so um, the, the title of the, um, the editorial, you can see it there now, is Logical Fallacies in the Running Shoe Debate, Let the Evidence Guide Prescription. And essentially, as I mentioned, um, this is something that, uh, that Rich and I, um, you know, I talked about writing because, uh, you know, we, we were uh, concerned as, oh, just lost, a, just lost a picture of my wall there. Um, <laughs> Um, we were concerned about, um, you know, the, uh, the more, mainly healthcare practitioners out there, um, and researchers who, um, um, obviously there, it sticks a bit more. And, and so we really wanted to lay it all out and look at, um, you know, there's, there is a lot of research out there on shoes and on shoe prescription. Uh, but what is the, the best of say um you know the the best highest level evidence say at this point in time and uh you know so we appealed to these logical fallacies and and one of those was um the the appeal to nature fallacy that um you know less shoe or, or a more natural um shoe design or or something that makes your foot move more naturally is um therefore uh better and um, and then the other logical fallacy that um, just because traditional uh, shoe prescription, so that is, um, you know, anti-pronation shoes and that sort of thing that have been on the market for uh, 40 years now, um, just because those shoes haven't uh, prevented injuries uh, doesn't mean that these other newer shoe designs uh, are going to naturally do a better job just because uh, the traditional shoe design failed. And so... Uh, you know, we put it out there and, and, uh, and just wanted to, you know, really address uh, the, the question of uh, can shoe design uh, prevent injury? And so we're talking about healthy runners. Um, we're not talking about runners who may have a pre-existing condition. We're not using, we're not talking about shoes in, uh, in use of, in treatment. Um, and we're not talking about performance either, uh, except I think we had one line in there about performance. Um, because I think that's that's an issue. Yeah, perfect. We'll come back on to performance and people with issues um, shortly because they're almost easier topics to discuss and easier questions mm -hmm. to answer. The big, the big grey area, the big area of confusion debate for everyone is the the new runner, what shoe do I wear? Or the uninjured runner, what shoe do I wear? What the, the shoes that prevent injury? There was a line in your editorial that that resonated quite a lot with quite a few people. I had a few messages about it when, when I mentioned that we were getting you on and it was um, something along the line, I'm just glancing down to see if I can see it in my notes here. Something along the lines of with respect to uh, reducing injury, runners should be instructed to choose one type of shoe over another, no more than a blue shoe over a red shoe. Um, I think I think a few people thought you, this guy definitely a Matrix fan and this thing's crowbar of Matrix. Uh, <laughs> a Matrix yeah, some people um, got the reference. Analogy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, but it does leave us in that area of, okay, what do runners do then? So, because they don't often, well, they very rarely, if ever, delve into the literature or even get a chance to speak to people like us who can, you know, talk to them about the literature. They go to the internet, they go to the magazines. And um, unfortunately, they're still um, a little bit out of date, I think it's fair to say. So, I mean, I guess two, two parts of this question. Firstly, how do we really get this, this message, this, this editorial message was great. Um, and to summarize, you know, we, we don't have all the answers and, and we, we just don't know, but we know that runners probably aren't reading the BJSM editorial. So how do we get this message out uh, to the wider runners? And, and, and also what they're going to come back at us with is, okay, great. You're telling us the wet foot test is nonsense you're telling us that pronation doesn't equal stability shoe but what they're going to want is to know what to replace that with i think that's the, the, the biggest challenge and probably why why we aren't moving on because we've got nothing to replace it with and people don't like mm -hmm. that but where do you see us going with regards to educating runners and advising runners on actually what what to do yeah so um so I, I agree that um, you know this this editorial was uh, you know published in BJSM and it was aimed at um, clinicians and researchers uh, primarily um, because that is sort of the the audience we wanted to um, 
to hit up and, and uh, because the, a lot of people do look to clinicians, uh, especially for advice on, on what running shoes they should be wearing. Um, and yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, what we came up with, uh, you know, we can't really recommend anything to prevent injuries um, per se. And so uh, I think we acknowledge that any changes in footwear, um, there's risk associated with that. Uh, so if people do choose to change footwear for whatever reason, uh, and performance may be a, a good reason to, to change shoes, um, they really do have to be cautious about uh, how they transition into new shoes. Um, and I think we touched on that a, a little bit. Of course, uh, 800 words is, is hard to cover everything, especially on this topic. But, um, you know, some of the feedback we had, uh, perhaps some of the, the criticism was that, um, as you said, who, you know, do we let people just go onto the internet or uh, reading Runner's World or, or listen to the, the shoe companies themselves? Um, and, you know, I think uh, we, we do have to be careful because there is a lot of misinformation out there. Um, and it works both ways. You know, we, we were sort of saying that um, the, the misinformation is in these claims that shoes will prevent injuries. Um, and if anyone is, is making that claim, then, you know, the, it's not based on evidence, whether it's, um, you know, a magazine article or um, a podcast or, or, uh, or a clinician or a researcher. Um, so, you know, I think uh, as far as where do people go right now, um, I would say look at other things in your training that probably make a lot more difference. I think, uh, you know, now that I've had a chance to really think about this and have a lot of discussion with a lot of people, um, you know, my biggest, uh, my biggest uh, key is, is just saying that I think shoes are, you know, we give shoes a lot more credit than is due, I think. And I think we could probably focus on other things in our practice, uh, making other recommendations about uh, changing training load, uh, monitoring training load properly, uh, using common sense. Um, and, uh, you know, and perhaps, um, you know, there is some evidence coming out around uh, uh, gait training and running form um, that may also be uh, more beneficial. So I think at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I told you at the start that I'm not really a shoe guy. Uh, you know, I don't spend a lot of time on shoes and, and that's really why I, I spend time on some of these other things um, more because I think they can make more impact. Yeah. Actually, yeah. just that, that point you made about making claims that they, they prevent um, or can be used to treat injury. It was really right at the start of the sort of the barefoot minimalist sort of issue um, you know, all these questions are being asked. And I, I remember at that time, it was quite a few years ago now, just looking back, looking at a lot of running shoe manufacturer websites, a lot of running shoe um, advertisements, none of them were making any claims about injury. So uh, like it was, I was, I was, even I was surprised that there were none. Oh, there, was, there was a couple, but they were, were un unimportant. They, they were saying, oh, this shoe reduces your cushioning. This shoe does this. They weren't linking that to injury. They weren't making any health claims for their product but then the minimalist shoes came on and the extraordinary number of health claims obviously unsubstantiated were being made it wasn't the traditional shoes making those claims so i actually thought that was quite interesting at the time yeah it's it's funny um i think uh you know there there, are, there were sort of claims early on about uh you know cushioning yeah. um certainly i can i can share with you here if uh see if I can share my screen. Um, uh, if you can see that. So this is uh, 1977, oh, yeah. the, the, the Brooks Vantage, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, which came out. And that was the, sort of the first uh, shoe with the, the Varus wedge yeah, to we, control yeah. pronation. And, you know, at that time, pronation was uh, absolutely thought to be linked with injury. And, you know, you look at their, their advertisement here, um, you know, normal, uh, normally initial contact with the ground is made on the outer border of the heel, hence stress is concentrated on a very small surface area, causing unusual heel wear and increased shock. Uh, the various rudge permits greater surface area of contact, distributes impact shock more evenly, resulting in uniform heel wear and decreased heel strike shock. That's all fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they get into the, the next part here, full foot contact. When the entire foot is on the ground, the varus wedge is thicker under the medial longitudinal arch. 
uh, hence giving support to this area. This increased support lessens abnormal pronation of the foot as the arch flattens, thereby making the foot a stronger, more efficient structure. So, you know, these are dubious claims. Oh, um, I have no doubt. I'm not saying it's going to prevent injury, but certainly um, people are associating with that. that with oh, injury. Yeah, I know, but that, I, think they, that, I think they've been very, very careful to not actually link that to injury. I mean, I, there's no doubt a lot of those claims that get, have been made were ju dubious, but that word, yeah, it's just that last little link. Um, now, the other claim about preventing injury, and this is something I've been thinking a bit about lately, if we look at the, the risk factor studies on running injury, and different studies come up with different risk factors, some of those risk factors are potentially modifiable by running shoes. So uh, there is a hypothetical, there is potential for running shoes to alter that risk. The problem mm -hmm. is the evidence that currently doesn't support that. So I just wonder if you comment on that. I think there is a potential there because they are modifiable risk factors by footwear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. And I think we do need to address that because uh, uh, what we've seen is that, um, yeah, footwear and, and, you know, if you take it going to look at going to minimal footwear, for instance, um, can have an effect on biomechanics. There's no doubt. Um, and some of those uh, changes uh, are seen to be, um, you know, positive in terms of what, what could potentially reduce risk of injury. The problem is, and what we did write in our editorial, was that, um, that sort of the best, most comprehensive long-term study we have, which was Fuller's uh, uh, paper in 2017, 2018, um, that uh, showed that, you know, those changes did happen early on, uh, but by six months, those changes were no longer evident in those people who had transitioned to those uh, minimal shoes. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, anything novel is going to potentially uh, change someone's mechanics. But by six months, um, we're not seeing those changes. And, you know, I think more of these studies do need to be done. There's, there's certainly, um, we may see that in certain people, those uh, changes do stick or on, uh, you know, in certain shoes or certain uh, surfaces or at certain speeds. But um, I think we have to be cautious about uh, giving shoes too much credit in the long term for changing oh, mechanics. I mean, I mean, that, that part of the mix and, and yeah. <laughs> and just touching on that, uh, Sheena's just, uh, who's watching, hi Sheena, she's just commented saying that her running club of 300 asked her to present to them uh, about selecting running shoes from her point of view as a podiatrist. And it kind of leans on, um, I think the paper was in 2014, uh, when it looked at what the runners think are important with respect to injury and, and mm -hmm. every research that's done this has always said runners think shoes matter um, so it kind of it's, it kind of feeds into the kind of education that there is still to do in, in this regard of, uh, perhaps I'm not saying they don't matter at all but perhaps they I certainly know most running clubs I bet the runners are talking more about their shoes than they are their load management for example um, <laughs> yeah I think we know which or, I think we know which one they should probably be focusing on right yeah, for sure. Okay. And it's interesting. I mean, uh, obviously, when you become a runner, the first piece of equipment you need is shoes. Um, so <laughs> you know, obviously, it, it makes sense um, that, uh, you know, people do spend a lot of time deliberating over what, what shoes they should get. Uh, and the first place they go is the, the running shoe store, and they get advice from those people working in the running shoe stores. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, you're right, they probably do spend more time on it than is uh, probably necessary, but, um, you know, I think I, I alluded to before, if, if you're making a big change from what you're already wearing, um, that's where you have to be careful. Uh, you know, if you're basically moving within the same shoe paradigm, it probably doesn't make much difference at all. Uh, if you are moving from one paradigm to another and so these paradigms might be a traditional shoe versus a minimalist versus a maximalist like the hoka or uh, the ultra zero drop shoes it's another example um, you know if you're moving between those paradigms uh, you just have to be careful and and again i don't tell people not to do that um, you know if people want to do that i say go for it. I mean, that's, you know, you, you want to be comfortable and happy in your shoes. And, uh, and I, and I say, that's probably the most important thing to me, find a shoe that you like and that you're going to get out and run in. Um, but, uh, but if they are, I'm, I'm, I absolutely give them a lot of education on 
how they need to transition very slowly, keep track of their um, training load. They have to really um, pay attention to any hot spots they may get um, as they transition um, and just let them know that there are risks involved with that. Yeah. Actually, yeah. An- another interesting perspective on that, and I often talk to runners about this, was uh, in, a, in a blog post I wrote three or four years ago, and it wasn't about this, but in the comments below, one one runner came on quite, not aggressive, but quite assertive that the he had transitioned or started running in the Hoka on a, on a running shoes and developed plantar fasciitis. Therefore, these shoes are bad because they cause plantar fasciitis. The very next comment was from another runner who was just, just as assertive that as soon as he started running in the Hokarane on his running shoes, his plantar fasciitis was cured. Therefore, that's the treatment for plantar fasciitis. That's what we're up against. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I say, as a clinician, what am I supposed to do? Get, get everyone out of hockers to prevent plantar fasciitis or put them all into it to treat it. Uh, and they, I, don't, I don't know, I get very frustrated at that kind of, uh, but that's what we're dealing with. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, that's, that's just it. I mean, uh, you know, what causes plantar fasciitis? Um, you know, there can be 10 different routes to getting plantar fasciitis, oh, yeah. uh, five of which may have nothing to do with running. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to be really uh, obviously careful about making those, those claims either way. Um, but, uh, but you're right. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, people will link that immediately to their, their footwear. It's sort of a natural thing to do. I mean, just as in performance, they'll, um, you know, get in a shoe like the, the new Nike vapor fly and, uh, you know, get a personal best, uh, in their next race and, you know, say it must be the shoe. Um, whereas you can argue maybe it's because they thought that they were going to be faster in that shoe. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, a shoe is an easy thing to identify. Yeah. But it also reminds me, and I'm, I'm, Apologize, I don't remember the reference, but it was a small, smallish qualitative study about where runners get their information from. And they, they, even though it was quality, even though it was small, they concluded that runners were more trusting of anecdotes from fellow runners than they were of health professionals. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, we're up against that as well. <laughs> for, for sure. And, you know, I think um, I, I'm lucky in that uh, as a, a runner myself and, and sort of, you know, being part of the, the recreational running community in uh, Vancouver where I work, um, I, I benefit off of sort of both sides of that coin, I think, mm-hmm. um, because, you know, I get people who have seen other uh, practitioners and, uh, but come to see me not because I'm, you know, necessarily a better physio than the other one they've seen, but because I'm a runner. And so I must know running better. And, and I, you know, there is obviously some truth to that. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think runners especially are really, uh, untrusting of non-runners. Yeah. <laughs> That's what that yeah. study concluded. You know, they were also more trusting of running shoe stores that actually did a video gate analysis. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, um, let's, let's talk about comfort because we've mentioned the word a couple of times and, 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 it won't have escaped anyone's attention that, that when the sort of old paradigms of shoe recommendations started to crumble a little bit, the wet foot test was shown to be poor and the matching of foot posture to shoe type wasn't shown to be as helpful as we perhaps once were, were, were believed it would be. What certainly swooped in to magically take its place for some was that comfort is king. So obviously we know there's some work that's come out of um, University of Calgary from um, Darren Stefanson and Ben O'Neig and the teams there that have talked about comfort. But, but when you look for it, it's not reams and reams of RCTs. And um, okay. you sort of say, well, people have, have been very dismissive of, of sort of matching how much you pronate to the shoe to minimize injury, despite there being a reasonably robust study by Lauren Malisu and his team in mm-hmm. Luxembourg. And they've sort of ignored that for just make sure it's comfortable. And there's less evidence in, in my mind for comfort than there is uh, for some other things. So could we talk about comfort a bit? How important is it? Do we have the evidence to say, yeah, okay, that's where we go now? Because certainly a lot of people now, they're saying just, just wear something comfy. Do you think that's enough? Yeah, so um, I recommend comfort, uh, but it's not because I say that's going to prevent injury. And, and I think that's the important distinction to make. Um, so I think, uh, you know, Ben O'Nig and, and his group there talked about the, the comfort 
paradigm and that there's a, a natural movement path. And so whatever's comfortable is probably something that fits your natural movement path and therefore is, is probably going to be um, preventative of, of future injury. Um, and you're right, there hasn't been uh, much evidence to support that. Um, but I, you know, I don't suggest comfort because it's going to prevent injury. I suggest comfort because you got to be comfortable in your shoes if you're going to get out and run. And that's what I want people to do. So, um, you know, I, I think, again, it comes back to there being probably other more important things to focus on uh, outside of shoes. If, if you go to a store, um, you know, you, you pick the red shoe over the blue shoe and, and it's because it's, it's comfortable. Um, just don't expect it to, to stop you from getting injured. Um, but if you're comfortable in it and you're happy running in it, then I think you've ticked all the boxes. But the problem yeah. with runners is if they got an injury from that red shoe, they'll start posting everywhere in social media how evil that red shoe is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Despite the fact that they went for a 10K run that night just to test yeah. the shoe out. And, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, I don't know how much time you spend on, uh, uh, you know, posting boards like let's run.com, that sort of thing. But, um, runners, runners can be nasty people <laughs> and, uh, and be very opinionated. Um, and shoes is just one part of that, but, uh, you know, there's not, not a whole lot we can do about that, but I, I think, um, just uh, trying to get the education out there that, um, you know, the, there are more important things that are harder to measure and, and quantify, um, certainly. Um, but there are probably more important things out there to do that uh, can have a greater effect on, um, on your injury status. Yeah. Um, anything else on comfort, Craig, or should we move away? Just oh, okay. Chris, Chris, Chris Bishop's just made a couple of interesting comments on comfort. Yeah. That's what I thought. One comment here is that, you know, misinterpretation of comfort. Um, sorry issue is what self-perception factors are related to comfort to explain it and then the second comment was how can we design things to manipulate comfort which is um a really interesting concept yeah um and and i think uh you know some of the shoe companies out there are doing that right i think uh it's brooks actually that is is you know um looking a bit more at modifying the, the shoe or personalizing the shoe a bit more um, to the individual wearing it. Uh, I'm sure some of the other companies are, are doing similar things. Um, certainly with uh, some of the 3D printing technology out there, I think some uh, orthotic companies are doing that um, and shoe companies uh, will probably be there as well uh, where you can actually, you know, scan your foot, from your iPhone at home and send it in and, uh, you know, allegedly get something that's going to be designed uh, custom for your foot. Um, you know, whether those things end up working out or not, who knows, but, um, I think that's certainly where the, the problem with the problem with those, the problem with those scanning is they'll, they'll arguably get the shape right, but it's about tuning it to, you know, different frequencies. And, and, and a classic example here is probably, you know, again, we're talking anecdotes as myself. I, if I, what little running I now do, but if I go in a zero drop versus a 10 mil drop, I can't feel it. Like drop doesn't, yet other runners can, you can change their drop by a millimeter or two and it, it has quite severe impacts. And, and, and again, is that a perception comfort issue? Um, and, and guess different runners are going to respond very, very differently. So it's that scanning won't get that. Scanning might get the shape right, um, but it's tuning the, the other design features. But that, that on its own has got huge potential. No, you're right. And, um, and, and some people might like that. They might be like being close to the ground. Um, others may not. It all depends on yeah what, what you're used to wearing, uh, you know, when you're not running. I mean, if you uh, take someone who's used to wearing um, heels every day for work, mm -hmm. um, they're probably not going to be comfortable in a zero drop shoe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly that could be a, a risk of uh, Achilles tendon injury right there. Right. So, you know, we do have to think about those things and, and, you know, uh, you have to use com common sense, um, certainly when you're prescribing shoes as well. So globally, we can say that there's no evidence, no good evidence to, uh, um, prescribe shoes to prevent injury. But, um, yeah, if I've got someone who wears, uh, you know, six inch heels to work every single day and, um, you know, is never spending any time bare feet, uh, I'm going to be very cautious about putting them into something like a zero drop shoe and probably push them the other way um, to, to give them as much heel under their foot as possible. 
Yeah, but but even in, in my anecdotal experience, even those with an adequate range of motion, you know, some of them just feel a lot more comfortable at 10 mil. Some feel more comfortable at one. And it, it just, each runner just seems to have a sweet spot. Um, yep. But it's the passion involved in trying to argue one versus the other. <laughs> I, I just think it's just, you know, um, you know, and I, I just sort of roll my eyes and you should get involved in the debate. Well, you know, actually there's no evidence that blah, blah, blah. And then you get the hate mail, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Chris, Chris has just commented and I think it's, it's, it's spot on. It's uh, you know, one, and you've touched on it already, both of you, what, what one person needs isn't what another person needs. It's, it's not a block recommendation. It's a, it's a prescription. I think the problem we, we know that we've been facing is that the entire industry and, and of course clinicians, some of them have been trying to teach recipes or, or you know, approaches rather than um, principles that we can apply to the individual in front of us. Because, because humans are, are exhibiting variation and that's kind of pesky and getting in the way of this being simple, which we all know. Um, do you think given that, uh, Chris, that uh, we talk about the complexity of the individual, the complexity of injury and how multifactorial it is and that the foot's only going to be a, a, a fraction of that, I mean, a different fraction for different people and the complexity of pain and different levels of strength conditioning and load management, nutrition, sleep. Can we even design a study about footwear that's robust enough to get the answers we want? Do you see us at some point in the future having, a, a, you know, a, a a less grey sort of verdict on this. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it, we know that uh, running injuries are multifactorial, and I think it's um, only getting more that way. If you look at uh, runners in the 1970s, early 1970s, um, you know, during the first big running boom, uh, they all pretty much looked the same. Um, they were, you know, skinny, long legs, uh, and, you know, they already had that build that was, uh, that pushed them into running in the first place. Um, you know, you mentioned, I think before we went on air, uh, the New York marathon this year, the average finishing time was what, four hours and four and a half minutes? hours. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. So, cool. yeah. So, you know, clearly we're getting, and, and if you look at any pictures of, uh, the, the crowd on the start line and the finish line that day, you're getting all kinds of people, um, from all walks of life and all different training backgrounds, um, so how do you prescribe, you know, something that's supposed to prevent injury for all those people? You just can't. So I think really, um, what we have to do is, as researchers is, um, try and get as homogenous, uh, a population as we can for our studies. Um, but try not to extend our findings to other populations because, um, you know, if, if you're looking at a, a novice population, well, there are going to be differences between males and females. Um, do they have, uh, you know, how much uh, history do they have in other running sports um, outside of running itself? Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's things that could be beneficial to um, experienced runners that uh, could be a risk factor for, for novice runners. And, and then you always have to consider um, things that may prevent or potentially prevent injury um, or reduce risk of injury uh, that may also reduce performance and how desirable is that you know one thing we know is that running slower has uh, lower forces on the body but you know what runner is aiming to go out there and run slower um, not me I'm recording. My, 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 yeah, my, you got, you my got 145 flies. in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, my, Chris, my, my, my vapor flies on order. My vapor flies on order. <laughs> Chris has asked another question, which sort of takes the discussion a bit of a different direction about, you know, how does the retail prescription model need to change? Do we train staff to better understand the foot shoe interaction? And it's, yeah, you know, it's a question I'd probably avoid answering, but yeah. <laughs> Well, the answer is yes, it's got to change, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think, uh, I just recently had a chat with someone in, in Kenya, um, a little side project I'm working on and when they're talking, there's, there's not much provision for retail footwear in Kenya, just, despite people thinking it of the distance running sort of capital of the world, actually, you know, you'll see the elites at, at a grassroots level, there's, there's not much provision at all. And we were having a Skype and, we were having this exact discussion. If you could build a, a sort of running shoe model, retail model from the start, which you can, so you don't need to unlearn anything. You don't need to, you know, uh, unteach people things. You can just say, right, this is what we do. How, what would that look like? And um, it was, it was a far more challenging question to answer than, than 
than it perhaps seems at surface level. We, I, I think there's a place for, and I guess it depends on the staff, but there's definitely a place for um, discussions on load management. Uh, you know, I, I just... I just think, or at least sowing the seed for these runners that yes, you need this to run or, or do you, there's a, there's a debate, but you know, you're buying a shoe, so you, you, you're buying this shoe to run in, but I don't want you putting all your eggs in this basket. At least if it's a brand new runner, just get in early and make them realize that actually how much they do over the next week is just as important, if not more than the shoe that they do it in. Um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are, Chris. How would you change the, re- what does the retail model look like in Canada compared to, because I've, I've got a UK bias. Um, yeah, I, I assume it's probably similar. Um, you know, I, I worked in a running shoe store when I was in high school um, and uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot from what I can see other than um, the, uh, you know, the, the different shoes that are available now. But um, I guess one, one thing in Canada is that uh, we have, and this is the same in the States as well, there's uh, the independent running shoe stores um, and there's actually a, a group, uh, and they get together and they have a big conference every year down in Texas. Um, and they, they work together, um, to kind of help each other out, uh, as opposed to the sort of bigger chain stores. Um, and you know, maybe some of the other general sporting goods stores that also sell running shoes. Um, and I always recommend people go to those independent shoe stores. I mean, you know, for one thing, it's great to support, um, local independent stores, but I think generally uh at least where i live um they have runners on staff Uh, and this goes back to trusting runners but um you know they have they have runners on staff who have probably tried a lot of those different shoes um they know the sport um as opposed to you know you go to a a, a store like um you know foot locker or something like that in in canada that uh sells you know walking shoes basketball shoes soccer boots um you know, and, and running shoes in a small corner and, and they may not have much of a selection um, aside from the ones that uh, are, you know, shiny and, and nice colors, um, you know, because that's what they've sort of seen that uh, sells the best. So, um, you know, I, I tell people to stay away from those stores if they're really looking for running shoes. Um, once they're in an independent running shoe store, uh, again, and you know, I think if you've got the shoe selection there, I just tell them to um, try on a bunch of different shoes and, and actually run around with them. And most of those stores will let you uh, even buy them. And, and as long as you just run on a treadmill and keep them clean, you can return them uh, if you don't like them and, and try something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know, is that sort of similar yeah. to? Well, no, I think, I think the pronation paradigm still prevails, whether we, we like it or not. And despite all mm-hmm. the efforts and and I know in, in these previous chats and, and I know even in my clinical practice, I know whatever I say to someone, they're going to go and Google it. Um, runners are still going to be exposed to that pronation paradigm. They're going to still want to know if they are a pronator or not, despite what you and I might say to them. Um, and it's, then it comes down to how much faith that they have in you versus what they've been able to Google about it. And it's, yeah. it's still a long way I, to go. <laughs> I think that, I think that is true. Um, although I would also argue that, uh, since, um, born to run, uh, there's, you know, maybe not equal, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly close to being equal, um, that the minimalist movement, uh, has been quite strong, um, with sort of the idea that uh, running in less shoe and, and more naturally is is mm. obviously a better thing. So, um, you know, I find uh, I'm talking about that as as much, if not more, these days in my clinical practice mm. than um, than trying to teach people that pronation isn't necessarily a bad word. Oh yeah, I, I agree. But they they might Google that and they might work out themselves they're a pronator, then be angry at you because you didn't tell them that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, how, it's, how dare you not tell? How dare you not tell someone they're a pronator? <laughs> um, so let's quickly talk about the um, the NAPIC research because I know they did three separate studies in three different military groups, and then they did a fourth paper, which was a sort of um, meta-analysis or bunching mm-hmm. of those three in one. So I, I don't know exactly yeah. whether that's four, four papers or one <laughs> paper or three papers. But um, um, 
What interested me about it was the way people, uh, and it's the same with all shoe research, the way people, depending on their, their, their beliefs or their biases going in, the way they take those conclusions and apply them and the, the inferences they make. So the big inference that at the, the, the time was, okay, and for those that aren't aware of the research, real real brief summary, they take people at the start of uh, sort of uh, military training, so they're generally matched for age and they're going to be matched for activity. And they bunched them into two groups. And in this group, they were given a shoe based on their foot posture. So the old classic uh, sort of uh, stability shoe for a pronated foot, et cetera. And in this group, they were just all given a stability shoe, sort of um, ir irrespective of foot posture. And what they showed is that across all three populations, I think it was Navy, Army and, and um, Marines, I can't remember what the three groups were. Uh, essentially, the, the injury rates in both groups were, were no different. Now, the inference for a lot of people was, OK, that means that in this group, when we matched their foot posture to a shoe, that the injury, the injuries weren't less than when we just give shoes at random. Therefore, throw away the whole model. Pronation is irrelevant. We don't need to match shoes to, 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 to foot types, etc. And I just to just to stir up some um, controversy once wrote a blog talking uh, leaning on survivorship bias so you know when play act when planes came back from active duty with bullet holes in them uh, there's a good story about a, a general looking at where most of the bullet holes were and saying we want to double down on the armory in those areas where the bullet holes were and someone much smarter said no no we don't because these are the planes that are making it back this is yeah. showing us where these planes can take damage we need to look at where they aren't being hit because that's probably where the one the planes that aren't making it back are being hit and they doubled up the armory where there were a few bullet holes and i think if we take that to this research instead of looking at the the group that were matched for foot posture and saying well they didn't have fewer injuries than than the other group if we flip it over and we look at this group they were, their foot their foot posture was just disregarded ignored and they were all given stability shoe and they didn't get more injured and i use this as a point to try and i was trying to basically pick an argument and stir up some controversy get some likes and some follows but um basically i said okay well we could take all new runners which is what these people were and we could give everyone a stability shoe indiscriminately and be reasonably confident that they're no worse off than the model we've been practicing for 30 40 years um, and that didn't go down super well with certain people because there's people out there who are saying all new runners need minimalist shoes. And there's that emotive kind of difference of opinion. Now, I think we've, I don't know that we've got as much data or as much of a plausibility and reasoning for saying all new runners should have minimalist shoes as we do for saying all new runners should have stability shoes. Take the weight of the shoe and the performance away from the equation. Let's assume new runners don't care super amounts about their performance for the first uh, few months at least what do you think about that as a, as a sort of um as an approach yeah I, and this has certainly been um discussed I, i've been part of lots of these discussions over the last couple of months as well uh, which you know some people may have seen um certainly with with at least one individual um <laughs> and uh i, I saw it yeah we and um you know, I, I don't uh, I, I don't disagree per se. Um, you know, I, I think logically, you know, it may make sense to try and put new runners in uh, less shoe. Um, you know, maybe maybe there will be a really good study one day that comes out and shows that that's that's better. It's it's possible, um, but at the same time, I think uh, you know, no, one, we're not talking about babies here uh before they walk right i mean people have some sort of loading history uh and whether that's in um you know dress shoes that they wear to work or um or or so be it but most people aren't walking around barefoot um you know perhaps in australia a little bit more than the rest of the world but um you know you, you, people do have a, a history of wearing shoes with some sort of cushioning or uh arch support so um you know i think to just say well you're a new runner let's put you in uh, a minimalist shoe because it'll keep you natural and natural is good um you know i think we have to be we have to be very careful about that um and to go the other way and throw everyone in a stability shoe I, again it, it just goes back to the fact that i think um other factors are way more important um 
training load. You know, we keep saying it, but um, I think if you have both those people and, and if you did a, a study that way where you put a, all new runners into either a stability shoe or a, a, a Vibram uh, five fingers, um, I think the, the, the training load would be the deciding factor, you know, nine times out of 10 uh, and not the shoe. Yeah. Here's a question. Let's say and we're blue. This is not possible, but let's say we could design a study where we, we got two groups of, of people new to running. However, we define new runner. I've just seen Mike's comment and we should probably touch on that in a minute about how we define a new runner, but two groups of individuals, they're matched for age. They're matched for prior running. They're matched for injury, previous injury profile, zero. They, they're matched for strength conditioning. You know, they're, they're essentially ideal scenario. We've got monozygotic twins and we've taken one twin group one, one and we've done that for all the pairs of twins and they're matched. And we put them all of group one in a minimalist shoe, all of group two in a stability shoe. And we completely match them for load management as well. Over time, there are going to be injuries in both groups because the biggest risk factor for running injury is running. What's your gut feeling on, I mean, the injury profiles probably vary, but which one of those groups is getting more injured? That's a horrible question, but. Yeah, well, I mean, I, to be honest, uh, I've thought about that and I, and I don't think you're going to see, if, if it's a large enough study, I don't think you're going to see a a difference uh you might see a difference in the type of injuries yeah, in the type of injury uh, yeah <laughs> and and there will be various uh you know different causes of those injuries um but i don't think you're going to see a difference between the two groups overall for injury for all injury yeah so the the summary the half time summary not half time because we're probably over halfway uh, mm -hmm. way over halfway the mm -hmm. half time summary in the uninjured runner who's perhaps new to running something comfortable is sensible something as light as possible is probably sensible something that isn't a huge deviation away from normal for you i.e what your feet and your anatomy is used to is sensible and even someone who's been running a while you know take a look at their prior running shoe and don't don't make too big a transition focus on the non-shoe related things like load management sleep nutrition strength conditioning and you're doing the best you can do you think that's a fair back of hand summary yeah the only other thing i would add is just uh really look at prior injury history as well because i think uh you know very few runners uh have have no prior injury history um and you know even if they're new to running um they certainly may have uh a prior injury history from other activities they've done or, or um for other reasons but uh that does probably play into it as well yeah Perfect. So let's come on to the, those who have prior running injury or, or current running injury. Because I think the problem we have as, as clinicians is we're, we sort of blame the running shoes for sort of talking uh, in, in outdated terms, but we don't appreciate always that they've got such a harder job than we have because 98% of the people we see, if not higher up, we see are injured. So we've got context and we, you know, we talk about pathology specific prescribing. So it's pretty easy to say to someone with an intermetatarsal neuroma or some kind of space occupying lesion get a shoe with a wide toe box or someone with a posterior ankle impingement get into a lower drop shoe I mean, those make and not as life sentences but they make sensible sort of um uh, sort of scientific sense at the time um mm. so in the in the in the injured and, and the prior injury is, is, is it is it much much simpler as far as you're concerned i mean we've talked we spent the majority of this uh, this episode talking about the uninjured because I think that's where the where the indecision and the controversy lay. Do you think there's any indecision and controversy when we come to talk about pathology specific recommendations? Because um, some will still some will still say minimal for all, as we know. Yep. And that yep. doesn't make sense. That doesn't that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know no. if you say that for the uninjured runner. It, okay, we could argue whether you're right or wrong. But yeah, you know, it's an argument that can go on forever. But if you say that to the the currently injured runner i think that's that's sketchy ground to be on yeah i think um i think it is a little bit more straightforward uh when you're treating the injured runner or someone who has a, a history of an injury or specific type of injury it, um you know we, there's always this uh sort of you know the, the pendulum swinging back and forth between how much do you support that uh structure and how much do you load it right so um let's just take achilles tendinopathy um you know do we want to put them in a really high heel drop and just really support that um 
or do we want to start thinking about loading it a bit more um, to to prevent you know future uh, injury or, or chronic uh, injury? So you you do have to. I mean, these are just basic um, you know uh, principles of injury management, uh, and the and the shoe is just a tool in that. You know, if you want to support uh, that, uh, putting more. Um, under the heel of that runner to start off with um, while you potentially load them through exercise. I think that makes sense. Uh, if you still want to, or if they want to get into something with a, a lower heel drop, you just have to be smart about um, how fast you transition them and, and um, you know, what, what effect that may have on the, uh, the injured or the priorly injured tissue. Um, I agree. Some people will still say, you know, you want to go, minimalist that should always be your goal um i think when you really talk to some of the people who who may seem to espouse that um i think once you have that discussion you end up coming to kind of a point where you, you do agree uh, i've certainly had that discussion with a few people who um i think it's sort of come across that way and and when you really talk to them about it um you end up agreeing that well no um you know, for, for, you know, a lot of people, you just keep them in the same shoe because if it ain't broke, then don't fix it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, for, for anyone who really does think that you should be going minimalist, no matter what, um, you just have to think about anything with any, any new activity or, uh, or, or change. You have to prepare the, the, the body for that. You have to build that, that load capacity. Um, for that. So if someone is really hell bent on doing that, uh, whether it's the runner themselves or because, you know, they, they've been told that you really have to, uh, double down on all your, uh, strength training and, and you're, um, monitoring that, that running load, um, for the time that you do transition to it. Sure. You yeah, just, just on that point about, you know, middleness or, you know, you know, you know at the end of the day, the sales of minimalist running shoes have languished at less than half a percent of the running specialty market for the last 12 months. You know, runners aren't interested. Um, that, that when I talk to retailers, Everyone's we, like hawkers now. <laughs> well, but when you, when I talk to retailers about a, a, a few years ago about what happened during the minimalist boom is that, you know, runners got these shoes, they tried them when they need their next pair of shoes, they went back to what they were familiar with. They didn't stick with them. And what's happening with the hawkers and the ultras now is that over 80% of runners that run in a pair of those buy them again. Whereas with the minimalist shoes, they're not buying them again. So they're, they're languishing at like half a percent of the market. So they've really lost interest. And it's been like that for over a year now. And I, I just, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I'll see if I can just sort of show... Um this is a, a presentation I did a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this is actually something, yeah, uh, this is, this is what I want to show you. And this is, this yeah. is from Rich Rillies shows this slide when he does his talks and you can see here, um, you know, the red line here is, is Hoka, um, you know, and you can see here we are, this is, uh, as of a month or so ago and, um, it's way up here and we've got the, the zero drop here in minimalist, you know, down here, and this is just a Google Trends query, right? So what yeah. people are searching, but um, yeah, I think uh, there's a, a novelty factor mm -hmm. uh, to do with the minimalist shoes that people mm -hmm. want to try them out. Um, but I think you know, you you just have to be probably that much more aware of your training loads and, and those changes in training loads if you're wearing something like that. I mean, I personally wear um, for a lot of my training, I wear minimalist type shoes. Uh, maybe not full minimalist, but um, you know, fairly minimal shoes. And for me, it's because I want to have something light and uh, and allow me to perform. So performance is really my my goal. Um, so, but I, I certainly adapt to that, and um, I am very careful about how quickly I I change my training loads. And um, you do have to be tuned into your your body. Um, you know, if, you, if you're wearing something that's going to perhaps be um, mm -hmm. less giving. Oh, yeah, Chris, no. do, you, um, do you wear multiple shoes in rotation? Uh, not, I ask not just because of obviously the, the team from Luxembourg's suggestion that that may be beneficial on injury rates, but I know that most of my friends that run the kind of speeds that you run them, they, they've, they've got six, seven pairs of shoes at any, at any one time. It's something that elite runners 
when that research came out, it was like, we, yeah, we, we've been, we've already just, we've been doing that. Is that something you do? I, I do. I mean, I, I, I do it to tailor to the, the run itself. And so if I'm doing uh, speed work interval training, um, yeah, I'll wear something that's uh, essentially a training flat. Uh, and I've always done that. So, you know, um, something that's low to the ground, uh, fairly minimalist uh, and lightweight. If I'm doing uh, my 30 K long run, um, this is going to hurt to, to wear that. So um, no, I wear something with a lot more cushioning in it. Um, so I'll rotate through that way for sure. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, if, if you look at the, the case study of the Nike uh, Vaporfly, um, the original design of that shoe uh, was much more minimal on the heel. It had a lot less cushioning uh, and the, the elite runners who tried that out originally, the feedback was that it, it really hurt to run in those and they wanted more cushioning. Um, and you know, most marathoners will tell you that, yeah, like at, after 30 or 40 K your feet hurt. Um, and you want some cushioning on your feet there. And so it's the trade off of having more cushioning, um, versus having lighter weight. And I think that's what really pushed Nike to, um, you know, develop or, or find this zoom X foam, um, that has the ability to be lightweight, but also provide that cushioning. And, and that's what the, the runners, um, you know, that's what their feedback was that they really wanted that cushioning, uh, in the heel. You, you're talking me into buying them. I, 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 I've, I've told myself I'm not going to, cause I'm not going to be that guy, but I'm probably am going to be that guy. So on, on, on race day, when obviously you talk about sort of a very, your speed work, um, and I dread to think how fast your, your pace is on speed work, by the way. But on your speed work, you wear something very flat and minimal. And on your long 30K, you run something a lot more cushioned. On race day, marathon day, where you're running 42K, and clearly mm. you want to be fast or you, you are fast, um, you know, where you, you land somewhere in the middle? Uh, so traditionally, I've been quite lightweight. Uh, I, I go more lightweight. Um, marathons hurt. <laughs> anyway so um and and really you know you're you're training uh for so long for that day that you really want to perform um so i'm thinking less about what might hurt or um because i, I know i'm going to have a prolonged recovery period afterwards uh and you know if i do end up sort of overdoing it on something um, i'm going to have some time to recover from that uh, so I, I certainly err on the side of um, being more uh, lightweight um, and, and performance based. So yeah, I've worn uh, the last few marathons I've done. I've worn like the Adidas um, Adios Boston Boost, uh, or sorry, yeah, Adios Boston, um, which is pretty uh, lightweight and and you know uh low to this the ground music to my ears this is my current running shoe so in my head now I'm okay thinking i'm 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 capable of a 233 if i'm wearing the same shoe as you that said well, I have or, six or pairs of shoes you've run two or three in it right so i mean <laughs> yeah, exactly right i have six pairs of running shoes currently um mm -hmm. yeah you can see all these golf clubs i have behind me as well and i'm a, I'm a horrible golfer as well so that's just the guy i am that just, that's just I'm, I'm distinctly average at whatever i do and i just throw money throw money at the problem so um yeah craig there's loads of questions that have come in and yeah. i'm just looking at the time yeah, uh, what just, do you want to do, do you want to go, sure. go I, I, i've got a quick question for chris you're not tempted to try the four percent i am i've got one on hold okay uh, <laughs> and and uh i've actually been running in the uh the nike zoom turbo the, the, okay, the yeah. Pegasus that has zoom x foam uh and i mean it is quite different i mean you feel the bounce back from that foam which is mm. different than any other shoe i've i've worn um you know, there's questions about the you know, duration of that, uh, both, you know, how many miles that that's going to last for you. Um, you know, is it going to last you 500 miles or is it uh, also within a run? Is it going to feel that way the whole way through? And I, you know, I, I think those studies are, are coming out. Um, but uh, it certainly has a, a different feel to it. And um, certainly within the running community, I think a lot of the elite runners have, uh, mm. tried the the vapor fly and, and do like it um, I've noticed just with the turbo that I my legs do tend to recover a bit better from those long runs those long marathon pace session workouts yeah, that's, that's the comments I've been picking up on here yeah, the, it's the, the it may not affect performance but may affect the recovery um, but again they're anecdotes yeah, no, now there are some other questions but we, we I'm conscious of the time and some of them are going to take quite a bit to answer um, 
So, you know, maybe this is... Short, a, pick the short ones. Let's have a yeah. look what we got. Is it anything that will take just a few minutes? Uh, what have we got here? Let me see. Comment from Jeff. At some point, we will find running is bad for just about everybody other than 13-year-olds and properly trained athletes. Most people should just be walking uphill, downhill for over 40 minutes two times a day. I mean, that's easy. Jeff, you're yeah. wrong. We're just going to move on from <laughs> actually, that. Yeah, um, actually, just on that, Jeff, um, check the latest edition of uh, Scientific American. Um, there's a, there's, a hot, there's several articles in the latest edition on how humans have evolved for more aggressive uh, physical activity than our um, ape and monkey predescendants who are actually quite lazy. Um, so it's an actually interesting read. Yeah. Plus running's just brilliant. So yeah, just go for a run, Jeff. You'll, you'll, <laughs> feel, you'll feel better and you'll see more clearly if you go for a run and think that through, run that one through again. Anything else? What have we got here? Uh, that one's, no, that's not an easy question. We'll leave that yeah, one. There, there are a couple of questions uh, there, but they're going to take a, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm yeah. conscious of the, that we, um, well, maybe if maybe Chris can dive on to the once the the video is buffered and on on Facebook, he can dive on and go through and throw some comments. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, yeah. yeah, is that okay? Yeah, so or we'll just have to organise part two. Sure. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Because uh, we could easily talk for several more hours, I'm sure. So uh, yeah. yeah, brilliant. So look, look, I think we'll finish up this. So thanks so much, Chris. It's gone over an hour. It's gone really, really quickly. There's probably we could probably keep talking for quite some time. For those of you who have joined late, um, just come back in 10, 15 minutes, Facebook, render the video. Uh, later on today, my time it will be up on um, YouTube and uh, the podcast version will be on iTunes and Spotify and, and everywhere else. Um, so thanks, everyone, and thanks again. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate it.